we have the great, great privilege um, to be joined by an esteemed elder in the community. Uh, her name is Pam Africa. Uh, Pam is the head of the International Concerned Friends and Family of Mumia Abu Jamal. And she is a member of the MOVE organization. Um, she lives in Philadelphia. And um, I'm going to unmute you right now, Pam. Um, so I want to just welcome Pam um, onto this discussion. And um, she'll be able to provide us um, with some more information um, and also um, answer some questions that y'all have. Um, so we're going to get into a little bit of a discussion. And then at the end, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, so Pam, are you with us? Yes, I am on the move. And thank you so much. On the move. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, being busy, getting ready for our demonstration on August 8th and doing some catch up because we had to run to Chicago for an event for Delbert Africa and one for um, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. Mm -hmm. so, um, so August 8th, um, you know, that's coming up in three days and it it talks briefly about the significance of that date um, being the first move confrontation. Um, can you tell Can you tell us what um, what like what y'all are going to be doing on August eighth? Right. Well, I want to say this: it wasn't the first move confrontation with this government. It's the first one that went around the world and made people aware of move and move innocence. You know, that's why you have people, you know, around the world who are rallied to our support. On August 8, 1978, after a year-long siege of the, gov with the government has surrounded our home with, um, you know, all kind of high-powered weaponry, cut our, cut our food and water supply off and off for almost two months, and all, no food or water, you know, coming in. Um, and this was as a result of the years and years of beatings and uh, the years and years of being beat, thrown into court and uh, thrown in jail, thrown out of jail. And May 13th was not the first time that moved babies were murdered by this government. And uh, um, our sister, Alberta, Africa, and uh, um, who was pregnant. And we had a demonstration. We demonstrate at zoos. We demonstrated the circus. We demonstrated the um, um, the Board of Education and uh, about miseducation and, you know, about the torture of life. And our uh, MOVE is a organization that is taught by John Africa to revere and love and protect all forms of life. And before hearing the information of MOVE, I remember reading in the paper that MOVE said, you know, um, let the animals free, let them roam the, you know, roam the street. And I saw that and I believed what I, you know, read in the papers and I, you know, what I saw on TV. But years later, I found out that what MOVE was protesting was the snatching of animals from their, um, you know, from their, um, place where they lived at, like the um, lions and the uh, tigers, the polar bears, and uh, you know this system that went all the way around the world and are collecting animals as species for our entertainment. We pay to see the enslaving of each and every last one of those animals. Nobody can tell me that a giraffe is happy who had, you know, the length and the legs to run, you know, the length of, you know, its domain, you know, there in Africa. And or, or that, you know, the panther, you know, um, this, um, the different birds and all the beautiful birds they have in zoos were meant to be caged their entire life. And uh, so MOVE made us see exactly that these wasn't, um, you know, and, and, you know, children are taught to go there. I taught my children. We used to go all the time. I lived near the zoo. And uh, that we were seeing, you know, 
something and we were helping these animals out because if it wasn't for us, these animals would be butchered, maimed, and killed. And, uh, you know, and this is not the solution here. But these are some of the things, the Board of Education, everybody knows, you know, even to this day, there's a lot of miseducation, you know, that happens there. One minute and dealing with what's going on now. Uh, Patrick Henry and Nathan Hale and them had the right, and, uh, you know, they fought, they protested about injustice, and, uh, you know, and they were attacked. And uh, But they overcame that by staying consistent. But right now, you have youth all on the street taking to the streets about injustice and, uh, you know, and want to do something about it. And their attack, that was the exact same thing that was happening with the MOVE organization. And uh, we're being attacked because of the information that we were putting out, the information that gathered other people together to not only fight police brutality, but the brutality that happens all the way across the board, and uh, to make you understand and see that when, you know, you go into a place called Whole Foods, or you go into a place called Moms, or whatever, the so-called organic, you know, place that is supposed to be selling you health food, and, uh, you know, um, and these places are actually selling poison, just like the other places. The apples, the oranges, the um, grapes, and uh, look exactly the same as if you was going to your neighborhood store or your other supermarket and you'd be going to Whole Foods because you don't want to go to a regular supermarket because the food is tainted, it's poison, it's not right. But when you look at that food, and I mean really look at the food in Whole Foods, it looks exactly the same. In in a restaurant or a supermarket where people um, go, um, where, where they have watermelons without seeds, where they have grapes without seeds, cucumbers without seeds, and all, this food is violated. And, all, you know, if you don't have seeds, where do your food come from? And, all, you know, um, watermelons have seeds, and it's a purpose for that. And, uh, you know, that's what the word organic means, you know, but we're so duped. And our move job is just to, you know, have people wake up and see things. And, uh, you know, because we have eyes that see but don't see, ears that hear but don't really hear, you know, and we talk and, you know, don't really understand what we're saying, you know, a lot of times. So, you know, the simplicity of what is going on around us. And why we protested, we protested for all life. And, uh, and it said that, you know, we are a all-black organization. That is not true. And uh, we have people, we have Latinos in our organization. We have Asians in our organizations. There's Jewish people in our organization. And we're predominantly black. And the reason why this government will put out that we're just a uh, a black nationalist organization, and uh, it's because they don't want other people to come and to hear what it is that, we, you know, we have been saying and what we've been pointing out. Why a government would do the things that they did on May 20, 1977? Why would they come to our home in 1978 with 500 stormtroopers? There was nothing going on. There was confrontation that happened, and because of Moose consent, Consistency and standing firm on the fact of our innocence and putting out the truth. The community came together, and uh, there are books and things that, you know, will show you clearly on April the 4th, 1978, and uh, thousands of people took to the street. I mean, when I'm talking about people, I'm not talking, I'm talking about people united and, uh, you know, uh, in all walks of life. And uh, po politics didn't mean anything because it was Democrats, Republicans, Socialists, all marching in order to stop this government from, um, you know, cutting off the food and water supply for MOVE because MOVE refused to move 
and are and were standing there telling the truth about the maimings, the beings, the killings of babies, Alberta, Africa, and you know, she was spread eagle uh, um, on a uh, police house floor. The other women was uh, locked in. One matron, uh, two cops pulled the leg, and a black matron by the name of Robinson repeatedly kicked her in the womb until she miscarried. Now, why was we there in the beginning? Because it was either demonstrating about the zoo, either demonstrating about the um, what is known as puppy palace, where puppies and birds and things were being killed in these places, uh, protesting about police brutality. Pro- I mean, it could have been any of those things. And uh, protesting about, you know, unfair, you know, boarding houses and, uh, you know, any of those things we could have been demonstrated. I don't remember exactly one. And, uh, but we were attacked, just like you see today, you know, because I'm saying things have not change and uh, but what's good about it is that y'all are consistent and you keep being consistent and all uh, you know and you're staying same as move has been and uh, so um the 78 confrontation you know was about that when they surrounded our house um and this also was after they killed three week old life africa janine africa's three week old baby and uh, our people was arrested for demonstrating again and was let out of prison late at night. This is what led up to the 78 confrontation, which led to May 13th. And um, they, they released them late at night. So moon people, when our people are arrested, and I guess, you know, within the demonstrations that y'all have, when somebody's arrested and they come from out of there, you hugging, you clapping, you glad to see them. And, uh, you know, that, you know, the effect, you're glad to see them alive, you know. Um, so, you know, when that demonstration, you know, uh, when they released our people, that's what was happening. And the cops and all... Uh, just came in from different districts, not the district we lived in, they were there too, but several other districts, and just started beating, maiming, and all, you know, and when Janine had, um, you know, heard the bus come up, and she heard her husband, you, you know, she knew her husband was on that bus, she came out with the baby, this was in the evening, just turned dark, and she went over, you know, to greet him, and then you know, she didn't realize that around the corner they were already, you know, the cops was already beating move people up. And uh, when she noticed something was wrong, two cops came. They grabbed her arms. She had the baby in her arms. The baby dropped to the ground. An elder that lived across the street and lived on the second floor said he heard that baby's body hit it, and he knew that baby had to be dead. He saw Janine pick the baby up and run into the car, uh, run back into the house. They locked, you know, um, the people that they beat up that night and then was saying that there was no baby, that the MOVE organization was lying, by, uh, you know, that Janine didn't really have a baby. Um, this is what kicked off the uh, confrontation in 77. And uh, it was the jailings, the beatings. And then when MOVE went into court and, uh, you know, um, when this government tell you to put your hand on the Bible and swear to tell the truth. And uh, they have uh, many people. Trump put his hand on the Bible and swore to tell the truth. And, you know, and on and on and on. And uh, also, you know, what Move said is that, you know, we don't have to put our hand on the Bible. Move will tell the truth. And, uh, you know, so um, Move was beat for saying that as well, thrown out the court. And uh, but um, these are the things that led up to a confrontation where they surrounded our house with 500. In fact, and all uh, what people can do, and all uh, because the story is lengthy, you can go and Google the move confrontation in Philadelphia, and uh, and you will see that confrontation and all the details of what happened there. And uh, they wound up surrounding our house, and a police officer by the name of James Ramp was shot and, you know, killed and all, but it was clear from the film that they took that when the cops came into our community, they went from the third floor of our house all the way down to the first floor and they said they're in the basement and that's where move was at. And they had to get a um some kind of a special jackhammer to cut off um to cut 
the uh, cement so that they can actually get access to a, because uh, they couldn't get into that basement area any other kind of way, and also that they can shoot rounds of ammunition in it. A sharpshooter testified on the stand that he said, and this was after they poured thousands of rounds of water pressure into the house. Um, he said that, you know, um, he, I'm telling you, a sharpshooter, right? He said where he heard the women and children crying and screaming, that's where he unloaded his gun at, his his rifle at. Um, so, I mean, it was the horrors of what was, you know, happening, you know, there. And I always like to tie this in with, you know, what is happening, you know, today. Um, that, you know, things haven't changed and all, but what we love about this is the resistance, the years and years and years and all, because the youth is at a point now that they're clearly stating that, you know, they're not accepting, you know, no BS into what is actually happening here. People got to come right or don't come at all. Um, so anyway, the 78 confrontation, a cop by the name of James Ramp was murdered. Um and he was shot. He was six foot above Moose level. Moose was down in the basement. He was cr- across the street from us. He was shot with a bullet going down into his body, not up into his body, but down into his body. And also it proved very clearly Moose could not have shot, you know, a police officer the ramp or the several other police officers that were shot laid down in the street because they were pouring thousands of round, uh, pounds of water into the windows, into the basement. So move, if, if move handguns could not get up and fire out to shoot anybody. But move winded up, you know, I'm, I'm uh, pushing on to May 13th. Our family was convicted of killing police officer James Ramp sentenced to 30 to 100 years in jail, and uh, um, Judge Malmit was asked by Mumia Abu Jamal because James Ramp was shot with one bullet, but they charged nine people with murder and couldn't prove that one of them, when uh, the Judge Malmit was asked on a radio show, a very popular radio show here in Philadelphia by Mumia Abu Jamal, who killed James Ramp? The judge said, I haven't the faintest idea. You know, I haven't the faintest idea, which is, you know, you just sentenced people to 30 to 100 years in prison where our family was not going to stand by for it. We continued to demonstrate, protest. They attacked our people in the prison, and that hit the news media as well. But on May 13th, was as a result of us still demanding that our family be released. Now, there were differences between, you know, the neighbors, but let me say this right now to make it very clear. And our, our neighbors and our stands firmly with us in everything that we do, the demonstrations that we've been having, because they understood that, uh, that they was being used as pawns by this government, because when they would attack move people, we would get on the bullhorn. We would get on the bullhorn and put out information. And the neighbors was with us at one point, and, uh, but then when they found out that the government wasn't going to, be, wasn't going to stop us and, uh, and that we wasn't going to stop, every time they attacked us, we went on that bullhorn, and we went on their move style. We didn't say, oh, the police, you know, um, they um, grabbed, you know, Mo Africa and they attacked them. We point out that these motherfuckers just grabbed uh, Mo Africa and they, you know, they broke his arm and, uh, you know, all the different things that he was doing. We wasn't calling these people, you know, um, monsters something of beauty and, uh, and wasn't trying to, you know, make our words, you know, sandy and clean and all you know for people to understand what it was that we were saying because it was week after week after week that this was going on and um the thing was they was trying to stop us again from putting out information and they couldn't 
And uh, when they found, you know, that out, that our demand was the release of our family and the other information that we was uh, putting out that drew people, um, they attacked the house on May 13th, 1985, because they couldn't stop, move, and uh, kill 11 men, women, and children. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, Mumia. And, uh, you know, you're talking about putting information out there. And Mumia was a journalist at the time. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, like, the history between MOVE organization and Mumia and um, how y'all have supported each other throughout the years? Yeah, well, you know, like you said, Mumia was a journalist, and there were several other journalists. And what was happening, the media was putting out misinformation. And uh, Mumia was the kind of journalist that he would come and he would talk, he came into the community. When they were saying that, you know, move is, you know, they have to demonize you before they come in to kill you. The demonstrators, they have to demonize them in order to do the things that they're doing to them. Tear gassing mothers and all who's protesting about, you know, the uh, things that's happening to uh, their children. Um, so they, you know, they demonize you. And Mummy was that journalist and, uh, you know, who was thinking, you know, well, what is actually going on here? So he went to the community and he talked with the people. And what he did, he put both sides on. He right. put what the community was saying. Some of the community that had a problem with us, he put them on as well. And mm -hmm. found out that, you know, we ain't really got a problem with, with you know, with each other, you know, for real. And uh, But we do have a problem with this government. But um, he constantly covered what was going on, where other newspapers would back down, oh, that's enough of, you know, move. They didn't got, you know, they was in another confrontation with the cops. Somebody got beat. Oh, somebody arm got broke. You know, it, 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 it was like that. And on almost making it appear that move people and all uh, was just doing things to make the cops break your arm, spit your head open, break your leg, and all uh, you know, um, you know, do something to cause a matron to snatch you out of cell and spread your legs and kick you into uh, in your womb until you miscarriage on the floor, and all uh, to you know, will we'll say that we made the cops beat the sing Africa and our uh, Asian uh, Jewish sister that was with us and Rhonda Africa walking down the street pregnant and uh, coming from a grocery store and was beat and uh, Rhonda was beat so bad when her baby was born it was born black and blue. You sing suffered a miscarriage. Janet suffered a miscarriage. The beatings, the maimings, and the killings. And for what? And uh, this was May 13th, 1985. And, uh, and, you know, the insanity was shown before the whole world because at that particular time, there had not been any confrontations. We hadn't been on the bullhorn or anything, but they planned to kill move the silence move yeah and um and mumia was the journalist that consistently wrote about it and he was targeted because he was one of those journalists that you could not you know tell him because he was he was a freelance journalist and he also worked at some of the most prominent whyy he was the uh, journalist that started off the beginning of and uh, he was the journalist that was on W um, H A T all the college and the, the uh, neighborhood newspapers. He wrote for them all, so he really couldn't be controlled to be saying, you know, what it is that he can say and what he can't say. And uh, you know, as long as he was telling the truth, like I said, he would be at the court cases, and then he would leave there and go up to the prison because they didn't allow us in court because we could defend ourselves. And um, he would tell both sides of the story. So before the trials was over and uh, um, they uh, beat Mumia, shot Mumia, rammed his head into a pole, and uh, Mumia was a cab driver on December 9th, 1981. And there are several documented films on the case of Mumia Abu Jamal. And I really want to invite people to um, Google his name and look at the at, at these different films because it will take you from 
19, it didn't take you from when he was a child all the way up, you know, through here. Films that was done by people in France and England, people in New York, people in California, and all, you know, that um, did the films of Mumia. And all people who came from France and investigated the case of Mumia and wound up making him an honorary citizen of Paris. Right. And all, you know, the capital of France. And in order to graduate from France, you got to know the case of Mumia Abu Jamal. And uh, in, in Saint Denis, there's a um, sign, and uh, a street sign, you know, for Mumia. And uh, you know, Mumia has celebrated, you know, around the world, yet he still sits in prison. And uh, because, and they tried to kill him several times. Um, you know, but what, you know, I want to do people have questions. I see it's 906 and I don't know how long people can stay on the phone, but if anybody have questions of me. Yeah. Yeah. Let's open it up for questions. Um, if, yeah, if folks have questions, just feel free to unmute yourself. Um, or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Uh, right. You know, I, you know, any kind of question, whatever it is that you're feeling, and all, uh, you know, um, put it out there. Okay. We got and all, uh, you know, um, okay. Okay. Tessa, go ahead and ask, uh, ask your question. Hey, um, thanks for taking the time and energy to do this. Um, something that really struck me was like how the city and the police use like evictions and like talk about move as like neighbors or community members um, as like rhetoric to kind of like justify the violence against them. Um, I wonder if you could speak to your experience with that. Oh, right, let me tell you. I lived down the street from move for three years before this confrontation. And I had never, like right now dreadlocks are popular and uh, they were not, people had them and all, but Rastafarians wore them, and they wore these uh, cats they had over them that could cover the dreadlocks. Um, the first time I saw a move, I was like, what the hell is that? I'd never seen, you know, uncombed hair like that. Um, I was the program director of a youth group. I believed everything I, you know, saw in the paper, everything that, you know, um, I saw on TV, although how these people would tell you, um, you can't believe what you see with your lying eyes. That's a quote from a DA here. And uh, I was seeing people wash and scrub clothes on a daily basis. I used to watch these people shovel the snow. And because the news media said that they was lazy and trifling and they didn't have my idea of a job, and all, uh, you know, so, you know, I carried that on. And all, uh, you know, when they were saying that, you know, they was filthy and dirty on the corner, and all, uh, you know, I was, you know, you know, they always was in Wranglers and T-shirts. See, you know, we're taught to see people, you know, not as they really are, as how the system wants us to see them. They demonize these people, and they demonize them in my mind as well. And all, uh, you know, um... Um, I was home the night that they killed three-week-old life Africa. I was getting ready to go to a disco, and um, the cop cars was in, in my block, and I was blocked in, um, so I couldn't go out my front. When I went to go out my back, it was cops all around there. And I'm saying, oh, this is something that's happening down on that corner with them crazy-ass mood people. Not being concerned, like, you know, these are people on this corner what's going on and uh so i go on do the disco i come back in the paper uh in the morning it said that um you know um janine africa said her baby was killed well i know she had a baby and i knew that you know and i seen the different ones you know used to sit out and they used to nurse they used to sit on this grass land and you know nurse and my thing this was 1977 and, uh, you know, and they're getting back into breastfeeding now. But breastfeeding was a no-no back then. And I'm like, 
these people are just as backwards as they can be. And uh, here they are scrubbing clothes. They had a, a bucket scrubbing clothes and, uh, you know, sheets and wranglers and stuff and, you know, hanging them up. And uh, where's your damn washing machine? You want to represent us as black folks and that's what you're doing? You're scrubbing, you know, and, you know, um, you know, they had all these dogs. And I'm like, you know, well, what's with that? What was happening, people in the community and uh, who brought dogs as puppies and uh, brought them, you know, brought them as puppies for, you know, Christmas, for a birthday present or whatever, and the same thing with cats. And, uh, you know, when a puppy would pee on the floor, they couldn't train them, they would put them out. And uh, they would put them out and you would see these skinny, you know, um, undernourished, you know, animals, you know, walking the street. We would take them in take them in, we would take them in and feed them. We would go into the park and, uh, you know, and not me at that time. At that point, I wasn't a part of Move, but, you know, uh, and people were saying, you know, that Move got dogs out the park where they have ropes tied around their neck and they were there so long that, you know, their skin was just skin and bones and a rope had actually cut into the skin. People were saying how Move nursed these dogs back to life, and they were very particular. Once they did, they would find homes for them. And, uh, but a lot of times, you know, they were pregnant, but they took care of all these dogs and things. That's why they was called the dog people. And some people had a problem with, you know, um, Move. And then, you know, we lived in a college area, too. Some people would get dogs and have them there for, you know, their protection. And when they leave, they just let, they would just let the dog go. You know, and that's not true with everybody, but it was true with a whole lot of people. So, you know, I'm looking at these nappy-headed, and uh, to me, I thought they were uneducated and, uh, you know, just want to, you know, be around the neighborhood. I didn't understand work. They were always constantly working. My thing was nine to five or seven to three. If you wasn't doing that, you wasn't doing anything. And uh, um, and they used to, you know, be they had this car wash too. I mean, and the blocks was full of people going to the car wash. And I remember I used to get pissed because I'm sitting in there watching my TV, and all of a sudden you would hear this clapping, and I come to my door to see what the heck is going on. You know, what is this noise? And they saying this word revolution. People was donating money because they were giving them information. I can't hear you. I can't make it. We can we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, oh somebody said somebody. something. I forgot what they said. But my experience with move was, you know, the same as a lot of people who did not know was victims of, you know, believing in what they see on the news media and believing what they, you know, um, see in the paper and, uh, you know, um, that, you know, they had no support. When that confrontation kicked off on May 20th, 1977, the college students, if you can go back into the archives, you will look and you will see. And uh, a long move fence was the cops on one side and the college students of every color that there were on, you know, standing in front of the platform between MOVE and the community and things, you know. I felt as though when I found out about it, about MOVE, who they really were, was on May 20th, 1977, when they came out with weapons on the porch of their home. And, uh, you know, and I'm watching the cops and, uh, you know, just, you know, ride by, because I was actually myself at that particular time, I was sitting waiting for the cops to come and arrest them. And all, you know, until I heard what it was that they were saying. And then I'm hearing what the neighbors were saying about what was actually happening in this neighborhood that I lived in and did not understand what was happening on that corner because we're taught to see people as different. And, uh, and, and yes, they were, but not to understand, you know, who they are and where they're coming from. I just allowed the media, this government, to tell me, who these people were. And once I found out on May 20th for 77, and all that I had been duped by this government, I went and called myself help and move because um, they put the, um, the cops had surrounded the house. This is 1977. The cops had surrounded the house 
and uh, um, and there was in a confrontation. If move came off the platform, they was gonna um, arrest them. So you know, I started you know a group because oh, what what really got me messed up was that the night that this confrontation happened. I wandered up in the apartment across the street from Move, looking down on this platform that they were at. And I could look and I could see the cops had lined the um, the um, rooftops with high-powered weaponry aimed down at the heads of the men, women, and children. And they had actually cordoned the area off a block, um, you know, a couple blocks each way and barricaded the people away from uh, MOVE and, uh, you know, away from this, you know, from, from what they were planning on doing. Um, but when I was up in this window with um, Mr. Wallace, who was an elder, he was in the wheelchair, he was mm-hmm. telling me, he said, this is a shame. And uh, he said, because them children, he called them children over there. He said, you know, they don't, they don't mess with nobody. He said, they clean. They be feeding people in the community, and you know, he said they wash them cars. And uh, you know, first, the second time I heard, well, not the second, when I heard the word revolution, and I was talking with somebody about it, he said they talking about doing that for the revolution, and you know, stopping them from, um, you know, destroying life. He talked about the water, the air, the soil. You know, and stuff. He said that's what they be talking about. He said they be cleaning people's, um, you know, houses out when people gas got cut off. They would make them these wood stoves and put them in their house and chop wood. Cause I said, oh, chopping wood, chopping wood. You know, well, what is with these people with all this damn wood chopping? And uh, the women was chopping, and the younger children was chopping it. So I'm seeing things. But, you know, uh, for the first time and realizing what it was that I had saw, I saw a a people building a community, and uh, not with thugism, and uh, and plus urban removal was happening there. And, uh, you know, and it was into the area where they was getting ready to cross over and start moving people out on the um, north side of Powhatan Avenue. The colleges was on the... um, south side of um, Powhatan. But the reason that they want to kill MOVE is simply behind the fact of the information that John Africa gave MOVE people, which is life-sustaining for all. It's something that everybody, you know, needs. And, uh, that, you know, and that is and, uh, to be protective of all life and, uh, you know, to truly love. When some people say to you, they say, well, um, good morning, how are you doing? And they keep walking. And before you, you know, they didn't really, it's, it's just a mm-hmm. cliche that they say. Well, if moves say, good morning, how are you? And uh, you're looking for a response. And, you know, sometimes a person say, oh, well, I'm not doing good. And they say, oh, okay, and move on. No, move want to talk with you, want to understand, and, uh, you know, uh, and help you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we got a we got a couple questions here. Um, so uh, Insight is asking, what pressure do we need to put on Krasner, Larry Krasner, to allow uh, Mumia's trial um, to move forward or get compassionate release? Um, right. So can you let people know who Larry Krasner is and maybe some updates on Mumia's trial? Right. Um... The um, Krasner is the district attorney of Philadelphia, uh, you know, now. He's known as a progressive, you know, um, DA. What happens with the case of Mumia and all, you know, people are supported until they get into that position and all of um, DA, mayor, governor, president, and uh, and there's an exception to the rule because Mumia is a political prisoner. Um, Mumia could be out of jail today, and uh, due to judicial and prosecutorial and police misconduct, the DA Larry and uh, um, let ten people go dealing with um, with judicial, police, and prosecutorial misconduct. And um, Mumia has, you know, it's the same thing with his.
but he didn't let Mumia go. And uh, um, he let 10 men go from court. Two people he allowed to go home from prison. They never had to come to court. But there was a judge, a black judge by the name of um, Judge Tucker, Judge Leon Tucker, and uh, who called for an appeal for Mumia, and uh, based on the fact of the evidence that was before him. Now, I'm talking about something that happened in 1981, and Mumia has been through several judges, several courts right. and all where they railroaded, 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 and then we finally get a judge who had the backbone, the stamina to stand up to the Supreme Court, stand up to the Fraternal Order of Police, stand up to the district attorneys and say, from what I see and from what y'all have heard, and all, you know, that's what this case smacks of. But Mamiya is still in, and what people can do is, you know, go and Google a lot of the information that's, you know, up on um, YouTube, you know, um, all over the Internet, you know, about the case of Mumia. And uh, yeah. because, see, Mumia is in jail not because they have the power to keep him, but we don't realize our power. We have the evidence to bring him home. And, uh, and my family was just released after some doing 40 and 41 years in prison um, for a crime that they didn't commit, the murder of police officer James Ram. The same family who was sentenced to 30 to 100 years for a crime that they didn't commit, that on May 13th, 1980, the government went to move house and killed 11 men, women, and children, you know, in the house. Some of the, some of the children, you know, mothers and fathers were in prison. Um, so, you know, move is out now, and our demand right now is that they release Momia. And uh, um, I wish that people would Google Case for Reasonable Doubt. And, uh, um, in fact, I think, um, Santi, I don't know whether you still have all those movies up. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for to go and look at them and, you know, see the people that's around who have come here and investigated this case. And, uh, you know, in fact, I don't know whether people on there that's old enough to remember the massive demonstrations. In fact, in San Francisco, there was a Mumia Abu Jamal day. In San Francisco, and I believe it was 99, they shut the entire West Coast down. Nothing moved. And of uh, the longshoremen, and uh, there were demonstrations Dem- massive demonstration. I think it's Dolores Park, you know, where Michael Franti, um, you know, um, oh, several David, other. The coup. You, you name it. Yeah, no, there is a, there is a, there's been so many artists, Alice Walker, uh, and 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 um, activists, um, uh, Digital Underground as well. You know, Black Star, most definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Most deaf. Uh, uh-huh. Eminem. Yeah. That Luke I didn't... Yeah, and Snoop Dogg. And some Dogg. of the greatest jazz musicians and professors, flowers, you know, all over. Public Enemy, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, like the the movement to free Mumia, like millions of people all over the world have mobilized to call for uh, Mumia to be free. Um, so what is that, what has that been like? And, and why, why, um, not why, but like, because it, it's not just a call to free Mumia, right? So can right, you tell us right. about like what the movement means on a, in a larger, in a larger sense? Right, well, I'm gonna give you an example here. Um, when, when me was in prison, he wrote books about what was going on. Well, he's still in prison. Um, books on what was actually happening on the inside of the prisons, talking about the murders and all. And these are all documented things. So the government here tried to stop Mumia. In fact, they did. They um, put Mumia, you know, in a hole. He couldn't, you know, I think he could only have one visit, you know, um, 
every two weeks. He didn't have, you know, any convenience of, you know, other, you know, inmates. Um, but here's a good example. When there was hepatitis C in the prison, right, it was killing people massively. And now I think a lot of people know about hepatitis C, but they didn't then. When Momia got hepatitis C, and uh, we went to work to find out, you know, what it, you know, what it was, you know, how we can get the cure for him. And when what we found out that there were seven thousand inmates in the state of Pennsylvania who had hepatitis C, we found out that ambulance was coming, just like you see ambulance running back and forth in the communities, you know, um, in our neighborhoods. And uh, that tide was born at the different prisons, and men and children were dying. Men, women, and children were dying in the prisons because of hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is something that attacks the kidneys and um, the liver. And, um, you know, you can wind up with cirrhosis of the liver. And uh, in order for you to get the cure for this, and uh, you had to have 60% of your liver calcified, you had to be bleeding from the esophagus. Your veins had to be busting. This is not what I'm writing. This is what was written in a protocol right. book for people to get hepatitis C. Nobody could get the protocol until there was a mumia, and or you know they wouldn't even give, give the protocol to state representatives. Um, but yeah. when when we got involved with the case of Mumia, we wound up getting hepatitis C to cure medicine for everybody. And let me tell you, people was telling us that we'll never be able to get it because the pill you had to take it for ninety days. The pill, thousand dollars a pill, wow. ninety thousand dollars is what wow. to cure. What a hepatitis C, you know, was, and the prison was just breaking out with these large and larger, you know, infestations of, you know, the hepatitis C. So it was a battle. So what we had to do, we had to find out all we could. We wound up going to the Board of Health, and we found out by going to the Board of Health that the hepatitis C, although there were 7,000 people in the prison who had it, and the Board of Health wasn't aware of the 7,000 that was in the prison. They was aware of the people who had hepatitis C that was on the street that had it and didn't know it and those who did know it. We found out it was 7,000 in the prison and 46,000 in a city, not the state of Pennsylvania, but the city of Philadelphia. The, uh, the figure was 26,000. So that, you know, we was able to actually educate people for those who had no concern about what was happening in the prisons, and uh, it became a big concern on both sides, because as long as they, a lot of people figured, oh, that's in the prison, and, oh, you know, we ain't got nothing to do with that, they deserve that, or whatever, you know, the things that people were saying to stop them from getting involved. And, uh, but once, um, you know, we found out about the 26,000 that was in the city of Philadelphia, and uh, and we got several counties and things, you know, in the state of Pennsylvania, um, we were able to raise the ante on it. We found out that the governor had an office at uh, Borden Walnut, so we would go there and demonstrate because we had demonstrated, you know, several places. And, you know, there was still, we demonstrated at the prison. We demonstrated, you know, um, where they did the drug at. And uh, uh, because, I mean, $1,000 a pill, you know, the sin of that. Yeah. When you have people who have no money and it was dying, they had a cure, but people could not afford the cure. And then they start getting it to some people, but that was very few. And uh, but you know, through us demonstrating and uh, relentlessly and uh, caused the governor and uh, to issue a thing stating that, um, you know, other people, you know, um, that the prisons would be able to get it, but it was the court case. We had to go to court 
and all, you know, to lift them stipulations up. Because, all right, you can, you know, the government says, okay, they can get it. But what was the protocol in order for a person to get it? That's what we had to expose. And because of Mumia, his case, people throughout the United States, because it wasn't until his case, Mumia Abu-Jamal versus um, the Pennsylvania Correction Center. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and he won that case. And, and when in that case, he got um, the hepatitis C cure. Anybody could file using that case to get the medication. Yeah. So I want to I wanna ask you about um, prisons because, you know, prisons are really normalized for a lot of people. Um, a lot of folks in the United States don't really, uh, they may not have experience uh, as to what, what the prison system is really like. And, you know, sometimes it feels distant or far away. But can you talk about um, just how, how, um, how, much of, how much sickness uh, prisons bring to all of us, uh, everybody on this call and society just as a whole? Oh, yes. Um, number one, you know, like people was thinking that that corona just there in the prison. Um, you know, when you have a loved one to go in there and they don't have any ills, and when they come out, you know, they darn near vegetables. And uh, um, we found out that the diabetes inside the prison was off the wall because of the food that they, you were feeding them. Because right. mumia developed diabetes from the actual, um, uh, for the misdiagnosis of the, um, I'm getting ready to say corona, not corona, of the hepatitis C. Um, when they misdiagnosed him, they gave him, you know, diabetes. And we was trying to make sure of Mumia's diet. Everything, and people were coming in young, don't have a trace of diabetes in their body, but by the time they spent some time in them prisons, they were diabetics because they gave them starchy foods. And uh, um, in the morning, a great big hunk of cake. I mean, you know, a big, huge slice of cake. Um you know, they, they very seldom got, you know, fruit, you know, anything like that. And uh, um, the um, the different diseases, and uh, because long before there was, you know, I'm trying to think of the other disease that they're dying with, you know, real heavily, you know, up there in the prison. It's the diabetes, it's um, the hepatitis C. And um, the other stuff isn't coming, you know, to my mind. And uh, But some people think that it does not affect the people on the outside, but it do. And all uh, the mothers, the fathers, and all uh, the children, and all uh, that's on the outside, you know, who have to um, deal with these situations when they come home. Because just like they were sending hepatitis C people home when they had the cure there, and uh, a lot of people couldn't get the hepatitis C you know, cure on the outside. So when they would come home, and and a lot of times they was, you know, um, sending them home, and um, they didn't have an idea that they had hepatitis C, and they were spreading, you know, the hepatitis C. Um, And then, you know, the things that go on inside the prison are saying, you know, really the same things that go on on the outside. We're fighting for clean water. And uh, they're doing that inside the prisons. The waters that, you know, um, we're fighting the pipeline. The pipelines up in the, um, uh, near the prisons is causing water problems. Mm. And, uh, you know, the um, pollution in the air. And, uh, you know, the overcrowding, overcrowding. And, uh, you know, um, that's happening now. And, you know, I feel for, you know, I feel like, you know, people that, uh, you know, in demonstrations and when they pack people in or they wind up going in, you know, they wind up sending them into prison and they send them into areas, they put them in the areas where that hepatitis C is, you know, going, you know, going, you know, heavy. Or they put them real close to where the uh, COVID, you know, is happening. As I understand, I was talking to 
one of our supporters from the Labor Action Committee that one of the prisons down here had 2,000 people in the prison with um, COVID. Yeah, in San Quentin? It, that's right, it was San Quentin. Yeah. And, uh, and how, you know, how that affects, you know, here and, you know, there. And they're not getting the cure. I mean, you know, they're not, you know, the testing. And, you know, there's things that you can do. They get a mask. I know where Mumia is at, they get one mask a week. Wow. You know, um, sanitize, you know, you, you just, well, half the time they don't have hot water. And, or, you know, to wash their hands. And the majority of the time the water runs black in the wow. prison. Yeah. And or because the water is tainted. And or you know, and that's happening um, you know, in several areas around, you know, um these prisons. And or because of the pipeline that they're um, you know, sending through through um, you know, through upstate, you know, uh Pennsylvania where majority of these prisons and things are at, and or people will cut their water on and fire will come out. Actual fire will come out. Oh, so they poisoning, you know, everything on the inside as well as the outside. A lot of the rebellions in the prison, you know, is behind the fact of mistreating the police brutality that goes on in the street. The same thing that goes on inside the prison, and or you know, um, the um, the medical conditions on the street. The same as you know, in the prison. And all the food conditions, you know, the same. And all, um, it's just, you know, it's just really a horrible, you know, um, situation inside these um, prisons. And, um, hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so Pam, I think we're going to, we're going to start wrapping up. I'm going to read you a quote. Um, from this shirt that, uh, that I'm wearing right now. This is printed in like 1999. So, and this is a quote by Mumia. It says, the greatest form of sanity that anyone can exercise is to resist that force that is trying to repress, oppress, and fight down the human spirit. So in closing, you know, um, you've, been, you've been in this, in this movement in a very serious way for decades. Um, and a lot of people are just, um, you know, with, with all of these uprisings right now, um, are just, you know, they want to, they want to get involved in different ways. So I guess what are, what are ways that have, or what, what has kept you, um, inspired and what has kept that flame, um, alive for you and for other MOVE members and, um, for Mumia and what, what advice would you give? Uh, us young young people well you know actually to stay you know consistent and uh um let me read something here oh man my phone is going off again hold one second it's so loud no worries so this is a life of of pam y'all she's always, always <laughs> yes <laughs> right <laughs> So um, I want to read you a little bit about, you know, a move. You got a minute? Yeah, yeah, of course. Move, move people believe all of life is equal, all coming from God, mama, nature, animals were not put here for man's sports. They have a purpose in life, just as men and women. The abuse of any form of life is reflected felt in all of life. All of life is connected, bound together by the law, a law that gives just as much value to an animal life as any other life. Move is not a back to nature group. Hold on a second. Okay. Move is not a back to nature group, as we have never left nature lifestyle is to come as close to a part of the laws of life nature as much as possible we are of nature and totally depend on nature 
as nature is in the air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you consume is nature. The sun that warms you, the very earth you walk on is nature. So to think that you can separate yourself from nature is wrong, foolish, dangerous, and the height of arrogance. Our diet is as much raw food as possible, fruit, vegetables. Our diet also consists of love, freedom, peace, honesty, family. This is the diet of the MOVE organization. We do not practice, well, you know, that's, an, that's enough, you know, uh, you know, quote, you know, for now. And, uh, but, you know, the fighting for life. And, uh, you know, and understanding the urgency and understanding we do not have anything to compromise. Compromising has gotten us to, you know, where we're at today. And, uh, you know, um, because we have compromised the air. And, uh, when people were getting ready to fight and uh, about air pollution, this government gave us the Clean Air Act. When we was getting ready to fight about water, they gave us the Clean Water Act. And that's exactly what it is. Because I'm talking about when I came around in 1977, and MOVE existed before then, but I'm saying, you know, there was a few bottles of um, water that you had to buy. Now there's rows and rows and rows and rows, and they got us all duped into thinking that when we get that water out these supermarkets and they in plastic, that we, you know you might as well turn your faucet on because the plastic is so bad the earth won't take it in. And uh, so I'm saying, you know, what would, you know, the, the mere fact of, you know, the locking up, the torture of any form of life. We fight for political prisoners, but those animals in the zoos is just as much political prisoners as we are, and are, you know, tortured, and are, you know, um, so, you know, the fight and what keeps you consistent is that, you know, that if we don't fight for our air, our water, our soil, and, or, you know, and understand who the police is, the police is pawns for big business, like the, the president, the governors, they all errand boys for big business, and all who is controlling this whole thing that is causing all of our problems that we have today. And I'm saying, you know, and knowing that, I cannot sit back and, um, you know, because I love you, Sanchi. I love your family. I love the brothers and sisters that's on this phone. So in order to truly love, I have got to take care of myself and, uh, mm-hmm. and fight for what's right as I fight for y'all. And all mm-hmm. you know, and the necessity of air, water, and soil. And all some people might not understand what I'm saying today, but you will tomorrow. You know that's guaranteed that you will understand the necessity of fighting for this and understand why this government have us fighting each other, and not really looking at who is pulling the strings here. You know, that fool, um, number, what is it, 46, 56, whatever his number is, you know, um, um, the presidency, you know, he's just a pawn for big business. Can't you see, you know, this big business, you know, who, you know, needed the Food and Drug Administration disbanded. You know, it was big business who needed, who pollutes the air, who needed a fool in there to go in and say, you know, well, we don't need that anymore. You understand, we would not be dealing with this corona the way it was if he hadn't got in there and pulled all this stuff apart that was set there from the beginning to deal with this. I'm not saying that you, I'm saying it wouldn't be as bad. And uh, it may not have even happened. And my belief is all them corporations together that's around the world, because one thing, this corona is everywhere. And, uh, you know, and I really wear my mask. understand that. I keep my gloves. I sanitize my hands. And I make sure things are sanitized around me. And uh, But, 
this is a government conspiracy here. You know, because when you looked around the world for the last, you know, God knows how, the people was uprising, uprising, and going after this government. This government had to put something there, a fool like him, and they got him, you know, in different other countries, and all, you know, um, you know, to protect, you know, protect them. And, or, you know, this whole thing here, you know, the division of us, and, or, you know, it's all created to protect these people who is destroying all life. The corporations do not care about form of life. They're the ones who have polluted the water, who have polluted the air, who have polluted the soil. The hospitals isn't full of of people in there because of Corona, because long before Corona, people was dying on massive, you know, numbers from breathing air and or from drinking the water, from eating the food and the different, you know, things that they got going through the air all the time and uh, that leave us twisted and, you know, <sighs> so I'm saying, you know, we got to fight. We have got to fight. And, uh, and this is what MOVE is fighting for. MOVE is fighting for all life. And, you know, um, I think people should join into movements and all that, um, you know, you know, deal with, you know, you need, you know, like, whole, you need to demand that they have watermelons with seeds, you know, cucumbers with seeds. And our grapes, I mean, what the hell? Grapes have no seeds. Do you know how healthy grapes is for you? And they done took the seeds. Right. And, uh, you know, we got every reason to, con and, and, you know, the things that go by us that we should be fighting about as well, and uh, they make it second nature to police brutality when it's all brutality. And, uh, and they protect. Let me tell you something. If you was to go into um, the supermarket right now and start complaining about the fact that the food that they're giving you is poison and uh, when it's wrong to poison people, if the cops come, who going to get locked up? Who are they protecting? They're not protecting the people who are being poisoned. Yeah. They always protect big business. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm not saying that you know these uh, little corner stores, you know, um, is big business, and or uh, you know, I'm talking about the bigger businesses, right, right, you know, to send them down there. But um, you know, as far as you know, um, getting in contact with people that's working, you know, around Mumia, you have mm -hmm. um, in Sa in San Francisco, you have the mobilization to free Mumia, you had the Labor Action Committee to free Mumia. And if people want, and all, you know, you could um, start your own, you know, uh, committee and all to, um, you know, free Mumia. Look at the actual videos and you will see why people around the world stand to fight for Mumia. And when we fight for Mumia, we're fighting for everyone. When we fight for MOVE, we're fighting for everyone and all for the education that people must have and are an example of strength because for 40-something years, you know, more than 40-something years, because I'm talking about the jail time, and uh, they have beat, they have maimed, they have brought the army to our house, they throw hand grenades in there, you know, put our people in jail for 30 to 100 years, and uh, they have bombed our houses, and here we are still here because we have a message. We have a mm -hmm. message, and uh, you know, to wake people up, and all uh, you know, and you know, show you all the way across the board. It's not no one or two things that we had the problems with, and all uh, you know, because if you ain't eating good food, if you ain't breathing good air and water, and all, uh, it's making you sick, and you got to be getting stronger and stronger in order to fight these monsters. Mm. And all, uh, but you can. Um, Get in contact with um, with me um, at the mobilization, the number four, Mumia dot com. You can also um, the camp to bring Mumia home, and there is so many things that people can do. And uh, because these films came from people who, you know, 
people know better what it is that they can do. And uh, people had made books on Mumia, and, uh, you know, um, people had did flyers, and uh, people had made, done songs about Mumia, had put benefits on for Mumia, and, uh, you know, to keep the information flowing to bring him home. So, like I said, these are things that you can contact, and our uh, brother Sante has done a magnificent job of, um, you know, getting, you know, information out, waking people up, and uh, bringing people. He's been a part of demonstrations for Mumia Move and against this government, and uh, you fighting for air, water, and soil since he was a baby. He was born into the movement. It's true, it's true. And yeah. I'm so grateful for, for having you and Ramona and so many other amazing freedom fighters in my life. It's a huge, huge blessing. And so I really just feel like I'm just playing my part. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that you're able to come on today and, you know, share some words with folks. Um, and yeah, we're going we're gonna to definitely continue building this on the West Coast. We had someone from the Netherlands tune in today. Um, we got oh. some folks down um from la who were on this call um so want to give thanks to everybody who joined uh we got folks from florida new york city um so you know mumia the movement to free mumia has always been international um and so you know it's just about uh you know creating those links and continu continuing to build those so I dropped some Instagram handles. I dropped some resources in the chat. So make sure to check those out. Uh, and then feel free to contact me. Um, I'll, I'll type my email in the chat right now. Um, and you know, like Pam was saying, you know, what it's, it's, it's also like up to us. Um, there's not one clear blueprint type of way it's, it's, um, it's also, you know, what, what we're willing and able to do. Um, so I just want to thank you so much, Auntie Pam. Um, right. And we love thank you so you. much. Stay strong, stay safe. And, and on whatever you do, continue to resist, resist, resist. Get on the move and resist the tyranny of this government mm -hmm. for all life. Yep. Yep. And you know, you got some you got some chats. Love you, Pam. Thank you for sharing your words with us. That was from Adi. Thank you, Pam. Deep gratitude from Jensen. Oh. We won't give up from Insight. Okay. Yep. Um Pam is oh. a goddess from Jumini. Yep. Thank you, Pam. Much, much, much love from Imani. Um, so, so yeah, I think we'll just, um, leave it at that. And then for folks who want to stay on, um, I'm happy to continue chatting. Um, if y'all have any ideas or just want to talk, um, but yeah, thank you so much again, Pam.